Good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this um, panel discussion. But first of all, I would like to thank um, Florida International University and Gordon Institute for providing us with this platform to discuss the critical issues of Haiti. And I think those kind of platforms are very timely because usually we analyze the issues of Haiti um, in a very isolated way. And I think it's very important um, you know, to always put Haiti within the context, within a regional context. So I'm very happy to be here and I'm, I'm very, um, I'm honored to be moderating this um, conversation. So my name is Jeff Skipwensi. I was born and raised in Haiti. I'm a specialist in um, public policy and governance. I currently work um, in DC for an international peace building organization called Partners Global, uh, which focuses on um, you know, peace building efforts following more like a conflict sensitive approach and locally led um, approaches. So before, prior to coming to the US, um, I've accumulated a, more than seven years of experience working um, in Haiti in policy development and project management across the government um, and, and the private sectors. Um, so it, it's a pleasure for me, for me to be here. Um, as many of you know, for the past six years or so, Haiti has been um, experiencing a very severe crisis, probably one of its worst crises um, during its recent history. Uh, and this crisis, he initially started as a governance crisis. It, it was a governance crisis, but ultimately it started having economic, social, humanitarian, and security implications. Um, and just to put that into, into context, um, for the past five years, Haiti has known a you know, negative economic growth, inflation averages 50%. Most of the state institutions of the, of the country have literally collapsed. The parliament is dysfunctional. The executive branch is also dysfunctional. And the judiciary is dysfunctional um, to some extent as well. Um, and one of the most challenges that we have right now is the security challenge. So now the security, of course, um, is a result of the governance crisis but it ultimately became the center of the overall crisis to an extent where we cannot talk about the future of Haiti without actually addressing this um, security aspect, without discussing you know, what other solutions should be provided to address this, this, um, this crisis. Um, so that's why um, we have this panel um, with me today. Um, we're gonna discuss short-term solutions as, as, you know, as we're trying to identify different pathways um, to contributing to a more safe, resilient, self-sufficient future for, for Haiti. Um, so now um, let me introduce you to our distinguished panelists. Um, first, we have over the Zoom, um, Leslie Voltaire. Um, and Leslie Voltaire is one of the seven members of the newly formed Presidential Council of Haiti, which is the transi transitional body that will um, lead the transition of Haiti. Mr. Voltaire is a well-known political figure in Haiti. He has held several high-level government positions, including Minister of Education and Minister of Haitian Living Abroad. He has also served as a special envoy to the United Nations and Chief of Staff to former President um, Aristide. Thank you, uh, Mr. Voltaire, for joining us. Um, we also have Michelle Pami Austin that just arrived. Michelle is a founding member of the Haitian American Foundation for Democracy. She's a practicing attorney specializing in representing municipalities and businesses. And she's also a founding member and former vice president of the Haitian Lawyers Association. Uh, she holds position on several boards, including the, the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce, the University of Miami Law Alumni Association, and also the executive board of the Greater Miami Chapter. Um, and then we have Dr. Charles Prosper. Um, Dr. Charles Prosper is a Haitian American scholar who is specializing in public policy and international relations. He has a PhD in public policy and administration, and he has also held um, key positions such as political and economic consultant advisor for the governor of Chris Christie in New Jersey, um, and membership of the National Commission on Science, Technology, and Innovation in Haiti. He's the founder and, pre and president of the 1804 Institute, which um, focusing on advancing Haitian American interests through research and advocacy. Uh, and last, we have over Zoom, Wazim Mola. 
Wazim Mola is a leading expert on Caribbean affairs. He serves as associate director and fellow of the Caribbean Initiative at the Adrian Arch Latin America Center. He has extensive experience in policy development and he has co-authored major publications on issues ranging from financial inclusion, climate resilience, and so on. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to welcome you on this panel and thank you for joining us. So, um, Mr. Voltaire, I, I, I would like to start with you um, joining us over the Zoom. So, uh, as we understand, the Presidential Council, setting up the Presidential Council has been a very challenging, a very complex um, process, particularly when it comes to electing um, the President of the Council and also setting up the right mechanism uh, when it comes to decision-making process in order for this, um, for this council to effectively work. Can you give us an update um, on where things stand with these efforts? Mr. Volta, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much, Mr. Poincy, and it's an honor to be invited on that ninth conference on hemispheric security. First of all, I would say that it had been two years of efforts between all the political parties and the major organization of social of the civil society to reach a point uh, helped by the CARICOM to organize uh, an agreement, a political accord that uh, create the presidential council. The presidential council is not made up with friends, but with various political parties and social civil society organization that had been fighting for democracy uh, and in their way. And now we have the Presidential Council that is, as you said, formed by nine members, seven, mem seven voting members and two observers. Now we had uh, uh, difficulty uh, choosing a president. Uh, uh, at the end, it was chosen by rotation of the presidency. We, have, we will have like four periods of five months of each uh, president. And uh, we will, and the president is only a coordinator, not a real imperial president. So uh, we still have one who is Edgar Leblanc. Uh, maybe he will spend like five uh, months. And we uh, just uh, sent a communique uh, choosing to help the sectors to choose a candidate for prime minister. We have set uh, the date for the 15th of May to have nine candidates from the nine sectors and six candidates, one for the diaspora, one for the women uh, association, one for the lawyers, for the youth association, and one for the unions uh, uh, association. I forgot the, the, the other one. And uh, we are uh, and from, from the university as well. And uh, we expect to have a prime minister at the end of next week. Have a full cabinet of ministers at the end of the month. Uh, that will coinc coincide with the arrival of the first contingent of the MSS, the, the Kenyans helped by the Americans by uh, with the logistic of so my expose is on governance and politics first governance we are establishing three uh, three organs for governance first the presidential council second the prime minister and his cabinet and third a supervision organ uh, trying to uh, imitate the, the uh, it's like a, a mini parliament to supervise the action of the government. Our task is first 
to establish the rule of law in Haiti. And the rule of law depends first on security, uh, security, the situation of the security. Is, we have, uh, we, we didn't have any uh, election for the past eight years. So we don't have any legal and legitimate institution like the presidency, the prime ministry, the parliament, uh, the, the mayors uh, <clears throat> and other institutions. But we don't have a, a, a legitimate uh, presidential council. It's, it's a social legi uh, legitimacy, but not an electoral legitimacy. So what we're trying in those two years is to, at the end of the exercise, uh, have election to elect a legitimate uh, president, legitimate parliament, legitimate uh, justice system, etc. So the road will be bumpy, but we have a roadmap that establish uh, first security with the help of the national police, of the uh, army, and of the Kenyans and maybe Caribbeans and Latin American troops. And uh, that will help us recover areas where the, the, the state is not there. And we have a criminal um, organization that is replacing the state and replacing the state in the neighborhoods. And that happened because we have neglected the urbanization issue. What happened is that we were a rural society and in 30 years, we began an urban society, but we were not prepared for that massive uh, uh, invasion of the, the, the rural areas in the urban areas. So uh, because the land is very uh, expensive, they established themselves in ravines, in uh, swamps, in areas where no humans should live and they are living in infrahuman uh, uh, situation. So it is a very fertile situation for terrorism, for gangs, and uh, the state is not there. So we think that we have to address that situation because we are more and more becoming an urban country instead of a rural country. And we will have to manage that, giving those people uh, uh, education, health, water, electricity, and all the services that one should have, mainly jobs. Uh, the past uh, minusta, uh, they did, uh, when the Brazilians were there, they did a good job policing, but they were promised that the World Bank, the IDB, the USAID, the European Union would come and address the recovery uh, uh, of the economic system, and it did not happen. And if the Kenyans come and we still have security without jobs, without economy, and without education, it won't work. So we think that uh, we will need a lot of assistance, not only from the, the police and the military, but also from those banks, the donors, that will uh, uh, help us put jobs in the country, jobs mainly in agriculture, mainly in uh, industry and services. Uh, it is a very nice country. If we have stability, uh, we can even think of uh, exploring uh, tourism because we have a lot of att attraction, uh, uh, beaches, monuments, history. And next door, we have the Dominican Republic having 10 million tourists and we have zero. So it, it is not uh, uh, possible to be in the middle of the Caribbean and not having tourism. Uh, and we think that uh, we will have uh, to, to do the reform of the constitution to create a permanent electoral council because now we, we will have uh, in three months a provisional electoral council, but because we have the constitution, the reform of the constitution that will help us have a permanent council. We will uh, have a referendum with the provisional uh, to adopt the new constitution, and then we will have the permanent uh, uh, electoral council. Maybe, so, maybe a lot of members of the provisional will be there in the permanent. 
because uh, we don't know what will happen to the constitution. But at the mint, at the same time, we will have a national conference. We will focus the national conference first, the, the first two or three months on the constitutions. So we can uh, uh, work uh, in parallel with the reform of the constitution. And then the, the uh, con national conference can be done in each department, in the diaspora, in Canada, in Europe, to see and, uh, what we want to do for that country to have a vision for the next 25 years and then have a state vision, not a government vision. Maybe if, if I can do an analogy, if we choose to eat fish for 25 years, uh, uh, maybe the next government will fry it. Then the next will uh, 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 will, will um, barbecue it. Then the next one will uh, uh, boil, but we're still having fish. So the state vision must be adopted by all Haitians, diaspora and others uh, in order to, to have a, a country that the, uh, my children, your children can live in. And yeah. that should be a reforested uh, country. But coming back to the, the governance, we, we, we have to integrate all the other parties and all the civil society groups that are not part of the council and the cabinet of ministries to participate. Let's say now we have 300 political parties. It's not feasible an election with 300 political parties. We will have a law or a decree reducing them maybe to 12 uh, or 15 parties, but not 300. It will be a, a catastrophe if we have 300 uh, candidates uh, uh, for president, for example. Mr. We Bode, think I, that I, I would like yes. to follow up with one 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 question, and and you mentioned um, in your presentation the the difficult context you know in which you operate, and one of the I would say one of the precondition um, for you to be able for the council um, for that matter to be able to implement this agenda is to have the security restored. So I think this is a this is a precondition, um, and this is the entry point. For having you know all those um, you know um, actions when we talk about um, um, constitutional reform, we talk about elections and so on. So I would like to give the opportunity to um, Dr. Charles here to to talk a little bit um, about the security, and we'll get back to you to to further discuss the, the governance aspect. So Dr. Shaw, um let's talk a little bit about this the military aspect of the security crisis in Haiti. And as we speak right now. The U.S. is actively preparing the deployment of the multinational security support mission in Haiti, uh, which is led by Kenya and involve some about 2,000 troops from different countries, including Kenya, Benin, and certain CARICOM countries. So, what is your assessment of this um, proposed solutions? And and I would like you to, you know, try to specify a little bit. Um, what are the different conditions that should be met in order for this um, Kenyan mission to work? And ultimately, what could be different factors for failure, especially um, given uh, the fact that a lot of this type of missions, um, some of which were much more comprehensive and integrated, ultimately failed in the past in Haiti? Yeah, th thank you for the questions. Uh, and good, good afternoon, everyone. Well, I think the fact that the Kenyan has to be there is already a failure. It's a failure for the nation. It's a failure in the sense that 1994, right, there was Haitian army. The Haitian army existed. And one of the function of the Haitian army basically was uh, and more or less to ensure security in this country. Since 1994 to 2024, about 30 years, there has been a systematic way to destroy the Haitian army. The police was constituted at this time. The police was more or less a community police, not really prepared for what is going on right now. And if you look at around the Caribbean, let's focus on the Caribbean, you see uh, in Haiti there are 0 0.001 a police for every 100,000 habitants. More or less, 
there are about two or three police for over for each 10,000 uh, population, 10,000 habitants in around the Caribbean. So Haiti has no capacity to respond and that capacity has been systematically destroyed. The, the international community, actually the US for instance, has prevented the Haitian army from having guns and munition. Uh, embargo has been put on the capacity of the Haiti security force to respond. So here we are in a situation where rather than building local capacity, we have to have two or 3,000 foreign policemen from Kenya come to restore or to help with that situation. That is a failure already for the nation. The local capacity is not being built. Now, is, do we need the international community or the international police of the Kenyan to help restore that situation? Talking with the Haitian police right now, they told me there has not been really, I know for sure there has been a lot of assessment by the Kenyan police and uh, American forces to see what, you know, the arm that the guns are using, what's going on, what type of equipment and material did they, will they need to affront the situation. But the elite forces, the police, I would tell there are about 10,000 police now uh, in Haiti, about two units, the, the, the UTAG, which is unit anti-gang, and the SWAT team, they are the one holding on. Uh, that's why the gang did not really take the entire, you heard probably that there are about 80% of Haiti under the control of the gangs. The 20% have not been uh, under the control because of those two force fightings. Uh, but they told me there have not been any relationship yet with the Kenyan, uh, with whoever are going to come. They don't know the real situation. They don't know the terrain. They don't know uh, a lot of uh, those uh, conditions. And, and, and the, the gangs, a lot of them said they are prepared to fight. So will that will they have success? The success will depend also on the mission, right? As you hear uh, the, the consular list just explained, militarily, if the mission is well-defined, if the mission is to secure infrastructure, secure uh, you know, national roads and, uh, and things like that, perhaps in coordination with the Haitian police, uh, part of it can happen. But we cannot expect the Kenyan to be more involved in governance. As we know, the gang situation is not only militarily, it's also governance. And those two, we were expecting those two to happen at the same time because one cannot happen without the other. So I'm not, I'm not 100%, I do not know, there are not a lot of transparency about what we have seen about 12 airplane, American airplane landing in Haiti just this week, bringing equipment and tools and all of that. There's not much transparency about, okay, so what's the plan? What are we gonna do? And the Haitian police told me, they don't know what is happening. So I think somehow, for some reason, uh, Haiti has been put in the back burner. Decision has been made without full consultation. We do not know. And this is a problem. And what I would suggest that we start doing right now and is to really get the local involved. I mean, of course, the local have been involved. Have you see what's happening in the political arena and things like that. And it seems things are not working the way it should. And that's what I heard from some of the international community. There is no counterpart. And as you can see in a lot of those meeting, atmospheric meeting, who represent Haiti, who is talking for Haiti. And a lot of those organizations, security organizations in the Caribbean and the CARICOM, it's like decision has been taken and, and, and offer and ask Haiti to implement. I don't think things like that can work. 
I hope, but right now the condition are not ultimum. Uh, absolutely, I, I think um, you outline it very well. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned, um, I, which I think is very important, is the fact that over time in Haiti, we've seen a process of outsourcing national security, um, you know, by involving foreign forces whenever there's a, there's, a, there's a security issue. And that ultimately undermines the capacity of the Haitian police to be self-sufficient and to be able to address this security issue, not only today, but should it arise um, in the future. Um, and one of the statistics, actually, I would like to bring up to um, you know, further reinforce this point is the fact that for the past two years, the international community has been um, looking for 2,000 police officers to, 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 to go to Haiti. Um, but at the same time, in contrast between the last two years, 3,000 po Haitian police officers left the Haitian police um, because of you know poor conditions, so you could see the 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 the, the contrast where you actively looking for police officers abroad to go to Haiti and restore security, but at the same time there's there, there's not um, a consistent effort to create the condition, the incentives for the Haitian police to stay within the Haitian I mean within the police and ultimately build the capacity so they could um, address the the issue. Um, thank you for for raising that, um, Mr. Voltaire. Unfortunately, won't be able to stay us, uh, with us um, for the entire time. I would like to go back to him. Um, Mr. Voltaire, um, you, you, you mentioned the difficult task that you have ahead. Um, you talk about um, restoring security. You talk about um, organizing the constitutional reform that would ultimately lead to organizing elections um, and pave the way for the restore of democratic governance in Haiti. Um, we would like to know what are the conditions um, that should be met um, in order for you with, uh, or for the council to be able to, to, to effectively achieve um, this, this challenging um, task? Okay, first of all, I would say that since our installation, I've been visiting the headquarters and the, the housing of the and the barracks of the military and of the police. This is disastrous. We can ask those people to fight against the gangs is if they are living without mattresses, without a cafeteria, without electricity and water. Uh, so it's it and without a good salary. I think that we should valorize our troops and our policemen, and uh, we should have a system to to give their children scholarship and, and to give them a card for, for clinics and hospital because they are living in infrahuman uh, uh, condition. This is the first, rehabilitate our forces so they can fight. And they are fighting, uh, I would not fight like that if, if I was there in their condition. So I think that uh, first it is that, and second, to, to increase the number of policemen, because we cannot have a country of 12 million people with 10,000 policemen. But to do that, we have to fight the, the contraband and the, and the smuggling around the, the, the uh, point of entry, uh, like the, the border, the, the airport, the ports that are controlled by uh, economic elites and we do not pay tax. We calculate that we could have 400 to $500 million if we recuperate those resources of the state because the past government have done the capture of resources of the state. If we can rehabilitate that, we will have uh, uh, money to do the election by ourselves and to fight the gangs by ourselves. But because it will take time to do that, this is why we need support for the international. We don't think that the international, uh, the Kenyans, will have to fight for us. We, we need them to train us, to equip us uh, to fight the gangs, because our police was not a police uh, uh, with objective to do guerrilla warfare. Now we have a guerrilla warfare with terrorists terrorists uh, that are employing 
uh, the kids, kids for uh, with nine years old, ten years old, that do not understand anything, that are burning hospitals, that are burning libraries, burning schools. Uh, this is not possible, and we understand that they do that because they don't know what they are doing. So we think that uh, with the Kenyans or lot other Latin American and Caribbean people, we can isolate the tell the gangs, consolidate the, the, the grounds in the, in the uh, neighborhoods and give jobs and, and give services. This is what we think that can happen. And at the end of the exercise, if the Kenyans stay for two years, we will have a police, a trained police uh, in quality and in quantity that can do the job after they, they, they leave. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and as, as, as I stated in the very beginning, the, the security issue that Haiti is facing right now is not only um, a security um, issue, it's, it also has different you know, components. And one of the aspects that we um, usually don't include in our analysis is the transnational nature of security issue in Haiti. Um, and those are two, there are two main factors that come in play when we talk about the transnational nature. First is the flow of guns and ammunition going um, to Haiti um, that mostly come from the US and also from other part of the region, including Jamaica and, and Dominican Republic. But there's also the linkage between the gangs in Haiti and the trafficking network, organized crime network in the region. Um, and, and for that, um, I would like to ask, um, I would like to go to, go to you, Mr. Uh, Wazim, um, giving your experience in, in working with, um, you know, on, on different issues in the region. So what do you think, um, what role do you think the CARICOM, the, the, the CARICOM countries um, could play in helping Haiti addressing uh, this, the, the security issue? Um, and I, I think there's a dual relationship here because when there's a security issue in Haiti, ultimately that increase the demand for guns, so that um, affect the region, but also the link between the gangs and the trafficking network in the region also is like a factor um, fueling the gangs in Haiti. So what can you, you know, tell us about that and what role do you think the, the CARICOM countries can play in effectively helping Haiti addressing that? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And first, I uh, want to thank uh, FIU and the Gordon Institute for the invitation. Um, as an alum of FIU, it's always great to participate uh, in this conference, especially uh, among distinguished panelists uh, like we have right now. Um, I think it's, an, it's a very important question, right? Uh, I think the first thing that CARICOM has been doing and con should continue to do is ensure that Haiti is top of mind, right? I think that we, we're in a region that is so uniquely affected by a variety of issues, right? You, you mentioned one being um, transnational criminal organizations, security issues, climate change, energy insecurity, food insecurity, and, and, and what's, what, what needs to be prioritized as well is Haiti, right? It's very easy for, as you go through you know, numbers of years uh, of seeing Haiti ebb and flow within the minds of CARICOM leaders. And, and, and it sometimes falls out of a priority. And when we, we've seen that, Whenever it falls out of a priority, you know, you know, the challenges that Haiti faces continues, right? It doesn't doesn't fall out of priority for for Haitians themselves and those that are are working within the country. So that's the first thing is that Haiti needs to be a priority among CARICOM leaders, and it needs to be it needs to be so over a longer period, not on, not just when there are international headlines um, at play. And and right now, I think that you know there's an opportunity for CARICOM to leverage the relationship that it now has with other actors such as United States, Canada, members of the EU to ensure that Haiti does re remain top of mind. What we've seen over the past two, three, four years is that CARICOM countries are, they're increasing in importance for US policy, for Canadian policy specifically, and should start and are building long-term relationships, not just at a government to government level, but even at local levels, at staff levels within government agencies. And they have to use that opportunity, use that leverage to ensure that Haiti is continuous, continuously getting the assistance that it needs. The second thing that, that, that CARICOM countries need to, to look at is 
how do they integrate the challenges facing Haiti, but also the potential benefits of solutions into its own broader regional economic development? How is a, a, a safe and prosperous Haiti going to benefit the wider region? And this is important for two reasons. One is to integrate Haiti as a true partner of the region in itself, given the pop the size of the population, the size of potential market, there's a lot of a lot of things that a lot of the positives that come out of Haiti will be positives for the rest of the CARICOM region. And two, how do you ensure that a, a prosperous Haiti can help sort of advance many of the opportunities and, and, and look at the bigger global challenges that CARICOM countries are looking looking for? CARICOM countries are looking to take a place in global stage for things like climate change, economic insecurity, whatever it might be. These are all issues that Haiti will also be facing. It needs as much of support from Haiti as Haiti does need from CARICOM countries as well. So I think the, the most important thing is to say CARICOM over a longer period has to ensure that you know whatever, whatever decisions are being made about Haiti, they don't fall to the wayside. It doesn't get overtaken by the next COP, by the next um, climate event, by the next security issue. Haiti has to be a consistent... Um, priority for CARICOM through intercessional meetings, through its engagement with the U.S. government, through its engagement with the Canadian government, and also through engagement with developers and private sector leaders all around the world. So I think if, if CARICOM can do that, that is the best effort it can give to support a solution in Haiti. Well, thank you very much. And, and I would like to echo um, the point that you mentioned, um, the need for the CARICOM countries to see not only the fragility of Haiti when it comes to security and, and other challenges, but also to see the potential of Haiti and what Haiti can effectively you know, bring um, on the table as you know, we are part of the community and um, what happens in the region affect Haiti and ultimately what happens in Haiti um, also affect the region. So um, I would like to also, you know, there are different mechanisms, multilateral mechanisms, different, um, I would say, partnership between the U.S. through the Homeland Security um, and different countries um, in the region um, to address issues like um, illicit trafficking of guns and, you know, um, drugs and so on. But for some reason, those mechanisms never fully integrated Haiti. And we were talking about the Caribbean Basin Security Initiatives um, and and so on. So why do you think that is, um, and what, in what way we can you know include Haiti and in, 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 in into those uh, mechanism? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the the challenge here is one, Caricom countries themselves have their own uh, a growing security crisis, right? Several of the Caribbean countries themselves um, have extremely high homicide per capita rates and are right now a little bit at loss on how to address these issues. You talked about, you know, previously about the flow of guns into the regions coming out of the U.S. Those same guns are flowing into Caribbean countries themselves. We're seeing um, ungovernable spaces popping up across the Caribbean, not in just places like a Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago, but we're seeing it in parts of the Eastern and the Caribbean as well. So you're looking at countries themselves at a national level that have severe capacity issues and are still looking at ways and mechanisms that they need to build in order to address their own security crisis at home. Now, when you incorporate the transnational nature of it, like you had mentioned previously, that becomes a, a, a huge, a larger effort. And, and what's happening is, especially when we look at um, U.S. policy design, there's a lack of understanding on the U.S. side of what of, of what the real issues are and where the issues are itself, right? So what happens is that uh, if you look at the U.S. policy on the security side, it just groups, it groups Haiti, and then it groups the rest of the Caribbean uh, uh, under one blob. And it's not really seeing the inter interplay between what's happening in Haiti, what's happening in the rest of the region, or even what's happening between the rest of the CARICOM countries itself. So what really needs to happen is is twofold. One is, is a relook at that policy design and see the different interplay between the different countries in order to have a better policy that is that can address a regional issue, but is also contextualized to the nuances country by country, um, uh, by country by country level. The second side of it is the capacity of the region needs to increase as well, because even if you have that sort of interconnected policy design, you can't exactly just send money or send aid down into the region. The absorptive capacity of the region is extremely limited right now, and it will need international support, right? There's not enough people to pay. There's not enough equipment to give to address the types of security crisis we're seeing growing in the region. So 
On one hand of it is a better policy design on the U.S. side. On the Caribbean side of it is increasing that absorbative capacity. So when the policy does come, you can absorb, you know, the, the policymakers there and also the resources that might be given. Thank you, Wazim. And Michelle, as Wazim just um, eloquently elaborated, the, the U.S. has a lot of influence in Haiti through, you know, different policies. Um, and I know uh, one of the, I would say, one of the, the, the positive impact of this crisis is that there has been, for the past two years or three, there has been an increased engagement of the diaspora uh, you know, in, 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 in the political life in Haiti in helping, you know, Haiti addressing this, um, you know, the, the security crisis and the governance crisis as well. So from a diaspora standpoint, um, and I know you've been involved in a lot of, you know, advocacy initiative through um, the Haitian um, American um, Foundation for Democracy. What role do you think the diaspora could play in influencing those policies? And, and especially when it comes to the gun trafficking, um, you know, going to Haiti. Is there a role that the diaspora could play here? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michelle Austin Pamies, and I am also a graduate of FIU, at least undergrad. So I had both UM and FIU um, in my background. I thank you all for putting this together and particularly for having a focus on Haiti. I thank you also for considering the diaspora a very strong force in terms of Haiti's economy. The Haitian diaspora is sending billions per year to maintain life, I would say, in Haiti by providing support for family members. The Haitian American Foundation for Democracy was formed three years ago. And its mission is to engage the Haitian diaspora in promote, promoting policies that foster democracy, economic development, human rights, and inclusion. Our, our focus is Haiti. And um, I'll tell you, this has been shown quite recently because we've been doing the work for a few years now, but Recently, we were completely engaged in participating and facilitating um, the dialogue between the different sectors of Haitian society, which resulted in the formation of this transitional presidential council. So we've been at the table, we know what's going on in country. What is it that the diaspora can do? Well, what we've been trying to do. So for years, as individuals, we would be involved in trying to build relationships with members of Congress, build relationships with folks in the executive branch with a view to providing our feedback, our perspective with respect to what's going on in Haiti and how the US government, which is in fact our government because we are of Haitian origin or descent, but we are now Americans, correct? We're voting here, we're participating, we're paying taxes, we're doing our share. And we have expectations of our government with respect to how they are acting, what decisions they are making that affect our country of origin, which of course we care very much about. If you can see, it's Haitian Heritage Month. And if you're in South Florida, you've seen the flags being waved all over the place and events taking place, yes. It's a country even our children's children still love. So a lot of people talk about the Haitian American community here. They may talk about what's going on in Haiti, crime, violence, et cetera, et cetera. But we, want, we don't want to be talked about anymore, OK? What we want to do is participate in the conversations that impact Haiti. And we want to have impact on decisions being made at the policy level. We've tried. We worked really hard on trying to advance the agenda to have the US government recognize that the former prime minister, Ariel Henry, was a one-man government, which is not acceptable anywhere in the world 
where you would like to see democracy thrive. So we try to push that and say he can't be prime minister and then be president too, since there's no president, or be the parliament too, since there's no parliament, and then have no elected officials across the country in every town, to be quite honest. So we try to push that agenda and explained for, for, for a couple of years uh, that we, we thought a better proposal would be some type of legitimacy provided by a consensus government. What can we do continuing? We can explain these things, which we have, and now that we are at this consensus government, which is flawed, okay, I'm not saying that it's, it's kind of a destination that we all aspire to, it's flawed because in some instances um, there were negotiations, but in fact the end result was imposed, okay, um, by CARICOM. So there are flaws in it, but if we can encourage this um, transitional government to act in good faith, we could get perhaps some hope for Haiti. And what it is, is that the US government can do a lot. That's what we're trying to push them to do. For example, don't have a hands-off approach with respect to security. Don't say, I have found some folks in Kenya, some others in Benin and a few throughout the Caribbean. They're gonna go in there and do something and protect the people. We want our government to look at the situation and say, where is it that there are gaps, whether it's the equipment, whether it's the training, you see, whether it's the strategy and provide that so that this could be successful and not just another experiment. We want our government to help this presidential council and the prime minister, whoever, get to elections which are free and fair. So we want the US fully engaged and we believe that the diaspora as the voters in this country should have a voice, do have a voice, and that we want to be heard and we want to be able to influence decision making as it relates to the country that we care for. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I think um, it, we can um, turn it back to you. Um, if you have any questions, we can have, a, I would say, five um, minutes of um, questions. I don't know how the mechanism works. Um, is, the, is the microphone? Is there any question from the audience? We'll get a microphone your way. Um. Hi. Good afternoon. I was curious about uh, the international link uh, of drug trafficking in Haiti. Uh, you, you talked about foreign actors uh, cooperating with uh, Asian gangs. I would like to know more. Wazim, would you like to jump in um, or? Charles. Yes, uh, Haiti is not a big consumer of drugs, of, dr of drugs. I mean, people do not really consume drugs. Dogs flow through Haiti. Dogs come from Colombia. Even the president of Colombia says so lately from Jamaica. What I've seen lately, I've seen the relationship between, for instance, the, the, the Jamaica, between Jamaican, um, traffickers coming to Haiti to get guns, they buy guns in Haiti, they bring ganja, they bring some drugs to those bounty, to those uh, uh, folks. And then those folks created some sort of um, ways for the drug to pass uh, to come to their final destination. So, and it seemed to me, and I've seen that, that there are a lot of foreign actors, actually, uh, Jamaican, Dominican, uh, they are supporting uh, gangs. They are, uh, there have been, the UN I've said, so there have been a lot of uh, private airfields uh, in Haiti uh, used by drug uh, 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 people. Uh, there have been, you know, there are a lot of private ports in Haiti that are not even controlled by government. So there is a relationship, Haiti has become very easy for drug traffickers. 
Uh, but while Haiti itself is not a big gun, is not a big drug, uh, uh, you know, Consumer. consumers, but it is a uh, traffic world. Yeah. And for context, Haiti has over 1,000 miles of coastline, and the Coast Guard of Haiti has about 2,000, I mean, 200, I would say, um, 200 people and only one vessel. So this is like a, you know, open border for, you know, all kind of drug trafficking in the region. I really like the question you asked because I feel like there's like this elephant in the room and no one's really talking about it. Imagine what business is it that these gangs in Haiti are in? It's a question. I can't believe that the only income that they have in order to have the type of weapons of war that they have would be the occasional kidnapping. I believe that we need to talk about it. We need to go to the source. It's, it's a root cause analysis. What business are these folks in? So that we are now addressing the business that they are in in order to get rid of them. It's not just who's this guy, let me shoot at him, let me get him in jail, jails that we can't even afford to maintain in the country. We need to look at that more specifically. I don't know what it is, but I can assure you that they don't have thousands of gang members roaming around in Haiti, only having as a business the occasional kidnapping. So we need to look more in depth at that. All right, um, we have a question. Okay. Thank you for coming in today, by the way. I agree uh, wholeheartedly with the second person. The Haitians really need to have an army again. There's no way for them to move forward. Sending English-speaking Africans to police a bunch of French-speaking Haitians is not going to end well. But that being said, and as far as the lady at the end said, with all this unavailable revenue that it's floating around there, and with the mineral resources that this country has, has there ever been any move to try to put this into a sovereign wealth fund so that there you could draw from it and you know be the strongest country in the Caribbean, honestly? That's about it. Uh, I would like to, Mr. Volter, um, I would like you, I would like to give you an opportunity to answer um, this question. Um, I don't know if you're still with us. Um, There's probably some connection issue, but please. My issue with that is this is not two billion of available funds for investment purposes. That's not what we're talking about. There's more than two billion even, but not it, it's not available for that. What's happening is that individuals living here who have family members or friends or people they care about living there send their dollars to ensure that they have meals every day. Now, we have maybe a professional class of Haitians or some entrepreneurial Haitians who can contemplate investment in a safer Haiti. I believe that that's feasible, but I don't think that money that we're talking about could be, I thought you're saying that they could take this money and invest it. I have to say, I don't know that there are billions of dollars in gold or oil, okay? Uh, I don't know that. And the person who would, I've heard a lot of things about it, but they have a ministry of mining in Haiti who can express that. And I haven't read anything from them expressing that they have all these reserves. Thank you very much. We will take, uh, okay. We'll take one last um, quick. Uh, thank you so much for the discussion. Um, being 170 miles away and being here, I want to ask how South Florida, outside of federal and Haitian American community, can be of help supporting um, Haiti to reestablish the state. Can you, can you uh, would you please repeat, repeat the question? It. How South Florida, outside of federal and um, um, Haitian American community, can be of help of helping Haiti to come back? as a country. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what, what I think you're saying, are you saying how, how can you help as a Florida, as a community in South Florida? 
Yeah, but I mean, that, first of all, the community must be educated, right? The community must know what's going on. I mean, I see, usually what I've seen quickly, it's, again, decisions have been made. I was sort of heavy and then try to implement those decisions without consultation with the local. So I think those forum, like gathering with leaders of the community sometime, and then and hearing who are connected with Haitian locally, getting feedback, I mean, can influence the community decision how to advocate, you know, how to approach the leader and stuff like that. I don't know if, it's, if I'm trying mm -hmm. to answer the question, but I would advocate for more dialogue, but more dialogue with local Haitians, like get really what's going on in there. And then before you guys, or just come up with policies trying to implement that because those things will not work. And then just finalize regarding the question that the, the, the sir asked in terms of, uh, yes, the army is needed. There are, right now, I see there are more than 20,000 Haitians willing to even fight for their own country. When they talk about the Kenya, they're going to get Kenya to come to Haiti. A lot of youth Haitians, there are people who stay in Haiti and who are fighting. You probably heard about the phenomenon called Wakale. The Bokal is Haitian and local community trying to organize themselves and to, you know, with the police, with what we mean of the police to defend the community. So he's Haitian willing to defend their own country? Absolutely. But why not go this way, this, this route, when we know the important solution is not sustainable? So I would advocate that to build that local capacity. For me, this is the priority. It has to be with Haitian, and Haitian alone can defend this country. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We're running out of time. Um, but before um, we wrap up, I would like to give the opportunity again to Mr. Voltaire, the, one of the members of the Presidential Council, to make a short statement, one minute. Um, Mr. Voltaire, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. What we will need also is uh, communication, assistance in communication. You know, uh, good news is, is, is no news. And always the press is looking for the bad news. We think that uh, with a good communication, one can assist the council and, and valorize the, the, the action they are taking. And every good action can be applauded. Every, every bad action should be uh, not applauded. And I think that this will help us convince others that we are on, in a good path. And uh, for the first time, we have invited the diaspora to be part of the political governance, uh, prime minister, ambassadors, uh, general directors uh, in the police. So if our uh, people in the diaspora can participate, that will be a very good help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the panelists for this you know, uh, wonderful panel and insightful comments. Thank you to you and thank you um, for you all for this. Thank you.